This is off planet radio. Welcome once again to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. We welcome you to the show. And uh, we're going to delve deep tonight. We've got great topics and uh, a wonderful guest to, who is joining us from um, his own platform. And we're going to go deep into the esoteric. We're going to get into some subjects that need to be addressed from the alchemical aspect. And uh, Emily's going to bring you up to date on what we're going to talk about. Hi, um, hi, how you doing? Good. All right, so good to be back. Um, so yeah, so we have a great guest tonight, and I was uh, actually honored to meet him when I was on his podcast and have been doing some looking into his work, but to be quite honest, his work, he really has quite a bit out there that he's produced in a fairly short period of time, and I feel so <laughs> like I probably should have done more, and so um, this is going to be a good sort of, uh, you know, learning session for Randy and I as well. Um, our uh, Guest's own awakening process led him to an interest in studying um, occult and esoteric texts from a variety of perspectives, and and um, he has spent the last couple of years presenting his findings from in a slightly different way than most people do. Rather than taking the stance that they are good or bad or something is evil or wonderful or whatever, he's more interested in what the people who believe these things actually think they mean, and and so. He's able to sort of look through the, the le many layers of this kind of uh, knowledge in a way that others can't when they have sort of a, you know, a, p a position they're really coming at it from. Um, so he has length, a variety of lengthy series on his YouTube channel, and he also has a new pro podcast called Proud to be P Profane. And so um, our guest tonight is Michael Joseph. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thanks, guys, for having me. Uh, good, good to, to have you on. <laughs> I hope the uh, introduction did you justice. Oh, um, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do what I can, and that's that's about it. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think by now most people know that we're pretty much discarding the formalities in favor of something that's loose and approachable from a human standpoint in a, an increasingly robotic society. So, um, hey, we'll put the spit and polish on it later. Welcome, <laughs> and this is. Um, you know, even just the name of your podcast, Proud to be Profane, <laughs> with the little, that this is, this, we should show this, I should throw this up, but I don't have the image in front of me right now. But to me, the concept of profane is kind of this joke that they play on us by pronouncing us as the profane. And uh, they don't like it when we wake up and we start to understand how they think, which makes your work so much more interesting yeah it's uh it's kind of funny because the logo is just something dumb that i threw together i but love it though it's, it's a little so more great pissing. yeah well it's a kind more of pissing on the pyramid <laughs> <laughs> well it's uh it's funny because like it has actually similarities to what you know baphomet means and part of that yeah. is like that is supposed to be this absurd image that's supposed to like deter the profane oh this ugly awful nasty thing let's not look into it at all. And so you know, I was just kind of like doing a play on the esoteric stuff that, you know, I, I do a lot of looking into the research of these secret societies and their doctrines, but when there's things that, you know, I don't resonate with, I kind of like to make fun of. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just like turning, turning things around because that's, that's what our world is. Everything's turned upside down. So I figured I might as well turn some of these symbols around. That's the whole point of the symbols, you know, using how you want to use them. And some people get like overly scared when they see a pyramid or an eye or stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Right? But you know what it reminded me of? I don't want to belabor this, but when I, when I looked at the symbol and realized what it was, it reminded me of this. I do a quick screen share here. This is the album cover from the Who's 1970, I think 72 album, Who's Next. 
Mm-hmm. That's them basically pissing on a monolith. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. 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 So I, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an artist, so I have to work with stock images. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it. I think it just captures the sort of, but it captures your idea perfectly. So we're going to talk in the first hour here sort of about um, the idea of staged events and created reality as an initiation for the masses. But before we sort of get into that, just for our listeners that are not familiar with you or your work, can you tell us a little bit about your awake, I mean, your sort of awakening process or your journey that brought you from being a regular guy, a musician and whatever, into doing the deep kind of research and, and now speaking out about it as you are? Yeah, I definitely didn't plan for this to happen with my life. Who does? Um, yeah, but um, uh, I guess the quickest way to explain it is I sort of woke up officially uh, when the Boston bombing happened. Um, you know, I'd always been kind of aware of different degrees of like social engineering and television and media and stuff like that. But I was always kind of focused on my own thing with music. And also like my, my whole thought was like, yeah, there's people in power. They know how to manipulate people through, you know, psych psychological means and whatever. And as long as you don't try to infringe on their territory, you know, do what you're going to do with your life. And I, I, I was never naive to like, you know, the powerful rulers of the world. I just, you know, didn't really think about it much. And so um, I was renting a practice space uh, from my band and the, the guy who ran it, who's a good friend of mine now, when the, when the, the, the bombing happened, we- um, You mean the firecracker incident? <laughs> the trouser bomb. Right. Uh, <laughs> the, um, yeah, my, my drummer had just gotten a new snare and there was something wrong with it just after a little bit. It was kind of weird, a little serendipitous. So the, the guy who ran the space, he's also a guitar luthier and he, he knows how to fix stuff basically. And uh, so like, let's we'll bring it up to him. And so we go up there and he's got something playing pretty loud about the marathon bombing and those kind of situations. I'm just like, you know, when stuff like that happened, even when I, I guess would just accept the official story, like, it didn't really affect me. Like I wasn't overly distraught about it. I'm just like, shit happens, you know, like move on. So I was just kind of like, Oh, rough, bad day, huh? You know, like I didn't know what else to say. I didn't really want to talk about it. And so he just kind of like, he looked like he wanted something else to say. And I didn't expect that he, we would be there for like two hours and he would be laying out the whole new world order plan for us. Um, and we, we asked, cause he was like, you guys don't know what's going on, huh? And we're like, what's going on and so uh yeah so I was like man that's not something you hear every day and I wasn't like taken aback by it I was just like oh this is interesting you know and so after that one thing led to another little things would happen I saw some one of my friends posted something on Facebook back when I was on Facebook about the Hegelian dialect in response to the Boston bombing I'm like oh what's the Hegelian dialect so I just like googled it and uh Mark Passio's What on Earth is Happening video came up and really I just started watching that and I just flew through it. It's like, you know, four videos, a couple hours long and within two nights I was done watching it. I'm like, holy crap. Like once I realized there was all this esoteric kind of religious stuff embedded into the world, that was when like the, the quote unquote veil was lifted and things were never really the same since then. And I've gone through many different phases of looking at all kinds of different things and you know, going through the the conspiracy world, it's almost like you're in your own little secret society, not by choice. And you go through all these different levels of initiation where like, oh, you'll start out with this guy or there's Alex Jones, there's David Icke or whatever. And then you start going through all these things and realizing certain things that might be a little off about other perspectives. And so I was just, you know, you go through this meat grinder of information and I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, there's a lot of questions that aren't really being answered when people are an analyzing a lot of this occult stuff, like just really basic questions. People will say, oh, the elites worship Saturn or they do this or they do that. And, you know, people are trying to present like what the controlling forces think and what they're doing. But then I'd have these like really innocent questions. Well, like, well, what about that? It doesn't make sense or whatever. So Long story short, I just decided to start reading some of the doctrines myself for no other reason than I just kind of wanted to know. It wasn't supposed to be anything. 
And then as I read through them, I mean, it's very dense reading. And so I'm the kind of person that it was kind of a humbling experience because like I realized there's a lot of words I don't know. So I'm like looking things up in the dictionary. I'm writing little notes and it just kind of organically happened. And eventually once you uh, start reading it, like it would literally take me like two hours just to figure out what half a page was saying sometimes, which it's, it, you know, I, I'm just, man, I'm an idiot. <laughs> you know, like I don't understand any of this stuff, but I forced myself to go through it. And I had, I had a mild interest in astrology since my mid twenties, but nothing that in depth. And so I had a little bit of a background into some spiritual concepts around that and what I'd heard about, you know, growing up Roman Catholic, you know, in the Catholic church, just when you're younger, that's just what you do, I guess. <laughs> Maybe not so much nowadays, but so, and then I was just like, little by little, you know, you start to understand a little bit more and it gets easier and easier as you go through it. And then I started to really realize that, man, a lot of people are talking about the occult out in the conspiracy and truth or world. Like they just have a lot of misconceptions about things, you know, and I did get heavily into like the more Christian viewpoint on it. I, I kind of like, you know, Mark Passio is like the esoteric version. And then there's this guy named Walter Veith, who's like a Seventh-day Adventist. He had his own series on all of this stuff. So I kind of saw the two pillars of the religious viewpoints where there's like this sort of Gnostic occult aspect of the, the truth or world where people think that that knowledge is just, just being used wrong. And then there's the Christian aspect that's kind of like all that stuff is satanic. And so I kind of am somewhere in the middle with all that now, but I've kind of gone to both polarities and that's kind of the alchemical process. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. And that's where I am. And I started throwing stuff up there because I thought, Hey, a lot of people might not realize what some of these doctrines state and what they believe. And it's really strange once you look into it and some of it, you think like, man, we might be having this big joke played on us with certain aspects <laughs> of it. Yeah. And then some, it's just sort of like, what Christians will say about the occult, they're just not that informed on their viewpoints. But also I notice that the occult sometimes isn't as informed about what the Christians view and they kind of take it to be the Roman Catholic version in terms of how we grew up, which I think is just esoteric Freemasonry. Like that's the outer face for it. So yeah. when you get into real like biblical Christianity that is um, more orthodox in the sense that, you know, they, they think that, the 25th of December and all that stuff. That's just pagan blasphemy stuff. If you really understand their viewpoint, there are some misconceptions I think a lot of the other people have. So I'm just trying to throw it all out there, be objective about it. I know what my general opinions are and stuff, but I don't try to integrate that into it as best I can because I want people to think for themselves and figure out what they want to think about it. And if people come up to different conclusions than me, I'm totally fine with that. Unlike some people who get kind of pissy if you don't agree with them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there you go. That's yeah. the best I can explain it. Yeah, no, I think for, for the fact that this just started for you and well, that was like 2000 at the end of the early 2013 or in, that. Uh, yeah, that, that 2013 that, is so when it happened. Just about five years now. I actually just had the marathon the other day yeah. and everyone's freaking out about security. And yeah, yeah. I, Allie Raceman was posting Boston Strong. I was like, oh, stop it. Well, we're, we're what, <laughs> we're, five years, we're five years out from that event almost to the day. Uh, it was, what was that? Was that was April 15th that that occurred. I know it was income tax, it was April 14th. It was income tax day. Well, Monday was income tax day. <laughs> and guess what? That's a, that's a holy day to the bankers because right. that's when the profane basically pony up and volunteer to continue <laughs> supporting the system that's killing them. Isn't, isn't it also, Patri wasn't it also Patriots Day? Yeah. So they, like they were that. covering uh, all the bases there. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. always do. Yeah, yeah. So it's impressive how much you've learned and also how well you've been able to come to articulate it in that short period of time. And I actually think that the, the sort of the tack that you chose to take in terms of rather than, than sort of throwing your own thought, feelings, you, you, didn't, you actually didn't get too emotionally involved. You just looked at things from a sort of more neutral perspective. And even though you now have some of your own opinions, you, you were able to sort of go through the information without it first. And I think that's sort of what has helped you to be able to really explain things clearly because it is, I mean, once you've decided that something is the good way or the bad way or evil or whatever, then you can't, you're no longer able to sort of take a, an honest look at the information, even if you think you're trying, you know what I mean? So I think that, that has been um, 
you know, that took probably good discipline from you to be able to do that, but that's actually what's made your work sort of um, special. Uh, just I think it's interesting that, that he was able to sift through what was, what took me 10 years. I mean, I've been on alternative media platforms since 2003. And I went through the Christian, the whole Christian thing. I mean, I know what they believe and I know why they believe it based on their biblical interpretations. And I know why they're wrong. And I know that by rejecting certain knowledge of the in, inner circles of the occult, that they are also not able to make a good analysis of, of the entire situation, which is equally true of both sides. And that's actually a beautiful point that you brought out, Michael. Yeah, and um, I, I think that there's a lot of value in the, the Christian viewpoint because there's a yes, lot of things sure. that it, it, but I take it, I view it kind of more like the occult does where I'll take the stories symbolically and they, mm -hmm. they something versus the people who like everything's got to be literal or else you're you know you don't have the holy spirit and all this stuff and yeah you know i've I, I just find that i saw a lot of instances where certain people like i i was talking about that guy walter vyth who again he has a very great series but there's definitely biases in there and i'm one of these people that i've had to learn to just filter out that bias and not get too emotionally angry about it. Even though like I do get pissed. I do have, I'm actually a very opinionated person. I just, I have to have that restraint because I think that that's the right thing to do when you're presenting things to people, because this is the thing. Everybody has to have that spark in their mind for themselves. And this is why I think that sometimes like people who are in the truth or world, or try to like force this stuff on other people. It's like, if people don't have the thought for themselves that the government might not get, you know, might be able to pull off some shenanigans. If they can't like just have that own, their own thought on that, they're really not going to be very receptive to any of this stuff. You know, it's like, it takes a certain amount of like, uh, you know, your own like initiation to, you know, yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, to look into it and, and, and entertain that thought. And some people are, they just don't want to entertain it because it scares the shit out of them. And I understand that. And you can't be overly forceful. There's, there's a difference between having a conversation with somebody and then you get to that point where you're like, okay, I know that continuing this is never going to get anywhere at this stage in time. And I think that unfortunately a lot of people don't realize when that threshold happens, even right. when you're in the truth or world, when they start debating on whatever earth shape or it's the Jews <laughs> or the Jesuits oh, yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Like there's a threshold where I hit where I'm like, okay, I'm just getting angry. I'm acting like an asshole or sometimes, you know, like people talk about awareness a lot. Oh, we, we all need to like have this uh, expanded consciousness. And sometimes I think that that is not a very great thing because what it's, it's the context of it. If you know more then sometimes that gives you more of a room to be an, an asshole. Like, you know, yeah. like, Oh, I'm, yeah. I have more knowledge. And then you start getting an ego about it. And I've had to combat that a lot too. I mean, once you learn a lot more things and you see people that have false conceptions about something or they're just a little misinformed, it's easy to kind of hold that over them. And I really try hard to not do that and remember it when I was in certain mindsets and the way I behave, uh, the, the way they might be behaving is no different than how I behave in certain ways in my life. Maybe it might be more extreme in more instances. Maybe it might manifest in different ways, but you know, I try to have a certain amount of empathy and understanding for everybody in every other situation. And that's why that that's one of the reasons why I, I try to approach the way I do. And, you know, I do get in some rants here and there. I can't help it sometimes, but I try most of the time to tone it down. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something I think that what, what you're talking about is part of this process for anyone who's actually like a, a you know, or genuinely seeking truth. I think we go through that phase where we're doing that, where we think we know more, so we're preaching at people and we're being kind of nasty and not not compassionate, and whatever. And then for me, like the, you know, when I got to a spot which is sort of where I am now and have been for a while, where like I will, you know, people want to hear about it, I will talk about it, and with other people, I will sort of drop little things here and there in a humorous way, but I don't, don't belittle them anymore. And I don't expect them to accept what I'm saying or believe what I believe or whatever. I don't need them to, you know what I mean? Like if they come to that in their own time and they have questions, they know where to find me. And I think that that actually 
is, does more to, like, I think more people take me seriously and I actually am a legitimate, um, more, more legitimate as a person to help somebody wake up or realize things now than in that stage before where I thought I had this expanded consciousness and that I knew more shit and, you know, whatever. I'm much more humble now. And you just seem to have gone through this process uh, very quickly. So you're a, you're a, your initiation process. Well, I think the other side of that, I think the other side of this is that what we're doing by being communicators is we're putting sparks out there that ignite in different places. And a lot of times what we do is we simply toss the spark. And because we have such smart listeners and we're actually able to assemble a research team around certain things and pull more data in than we could ever do ourselves. So in a sense, we've kind of amassed this collective consciousness that's a group of researchers that work kind of synergistically. And yeah, and I think that um, another thing too is everybody's different. And some people, they, they're more naturally able to be assertive about it and, and, and get in arguments, but in a way that that's kind of who they are, where I'm not like that. I'm, I'm really like an empathetic person. Like I feel the beasts come out of people when I start talking about some things. And sometimes it's like <laughs> extreme silence, but I can tell they're like, oh my God, like I don't want to talk about this right now. And I'm like, okay, I need to back off because I can't help but feel what they're feeling. And so I'm not a very good person for that kind of thing. But then like I'll see certain people like, uh, I think you guys had him on the chemtrail guy. Is it Matt? Matt Landman. Matt yeah. Landman, yeah. He's the kind of person who seems like he can go out and engage with people because he has like different talents with that. Just from like, the vibe I listen to him, you know, like th th there's the people that can go out there and do that. And then people like me, I am, I'm like, I'll be the worst. You strike me as an empath. <laughs> you, strike, you strike me as somebody who's very empathic, who has a sense of space within people's uh, realm of the mind and emotions and stuff. Am I, am I right about Yeah, that? yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it has its pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, when, when you get this charge coming from people, like I, some days I can deal with it fine and I know what it is and it's okay. And some days I'm just like, holy crap, that follows me around the rest of the day. Yeah. It's not that like, I, um, I, I don't know. It's just like, because it's such a rush of energy from them. Mm -hmm. it, it's it can stick with you for a while and it's it's weird some days i'm actually sometimes i'm actually really impervious to it it just depends on the situation it's very strange but yeah, no well that is empathic that's actually where you're absorbing the energetic that's coming off of the, of the person you're communicating with mm -hmm. that's 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 a sign of somebody who is respectful of a person's <laughs> space and uh i i've kind of gone both ways i'm back towards empathic and not battling with people as much as I used to. Yeah. And I, you know, everybody kind of goes through different transitions where, you know, there are certain points when I was younger where I was way more of an asshole about a lot of things, you know, and, but you, you kind of realize you get a lot of those things reflected back at you. And if you take yeah. notice of that, you kind of realize what it was where some people don't make that connection and they just keep going on and repeating the patterns. But, it, you know, to me, to use a, a Freemasonic concept in a uh, positive way. It's like, you know, the two pillars of mercy and severity. You want to have a balance of both. Sometimes you got to be a little harsh about something, but it's like tough love in a real way. Yep. You don't do that without being able to be sen sensitive to the person's situation, whereas some people are too much on one or the other, where they become too much of a victim. They're just too giving, but, you know, like either way. And so having that middle path with some of these things, like, these are just, you know, some esoteric concepts that, you know, Freemasonry doesn't have a stranglehold over that. That's just kind of the nature of life. But they do have a lot of these ideas built in that I think do a good job of relaying some of these concepts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So since we're going to talk about, you know, sort of some staged events here, because, I, you know, I think I'd heard you mention it before and just my own sort of tracking of your timeline led me to believe that the Boston bombing was what sort of led this to you. Um, let's just start there for a second. Did, was that the first thing you, did you, when that came up and that started an awakening process for you, did you sort of peel through that and look at the different layers and, and what did you see there? Um, honestly, when those sorts of things happen, I just shut off the media. I don't listen to anything. Yeah. I just watch how people react to it. And it's because like, I hate, television or at least in like, I, I grew up and 
in a household where the freaking news was just always on. And <laughs> I would just walk by and I'm looking at it and I'm just like, I was like saying to my dad, like they're, they're talking to you like you're a child. Like this isn't how you make people smarter. You don't like, you know, like the, the basic vibe that the news projects to you is like, you're an idiot moron. So we're going to have the authorities let you know how these complex things were, you know what I mean? And I just like, it just turned me off so much. And over time you see more and more layers of that. So I just, I'm one of these people, I just don't watch the news ever. I, I don't care about it. Yeah. And I, I mentioned that to people and they're like, like, how do you know what's going on? And I'm like, you know, to be perfectly honest, the only thing that news has ever done for me is like, know when there's a snowstorm coming. Yeah. But with everything else, I, I can't honestly say there was a time where like knowing something that happened, like, like helped me for real other than just being aware of it. Like e even with the, the Boston stuff, like if I just, you know, not be because I wasn't, I don't live in Boston. So I just, uh, I was completely outside of it, but I'd watch people react. My roommates, everyone's freaking out. And then once I started looking at some of the, the, the stuff, well, one of the things that really weirded me out about it was uh, the, the kid who's supposedly running away on the run. They, they drag out this manhunt. It's like, oh, he's like texting on Twitter. I'm like, dude, you're telling me that all this NSA surveillance that knows, knows where I was back in 2000 when I sent an email. And now you, you, you're on anything and you're like, oh, Facebook, I check in. Where, you know what I mean? Like it knows where you are. You're telling me all that stuff. They couldn't find some asshole running around on Twitter making posts. Like, come on. Well, and you, you know, know that right after you've bombed a, a, a building and you're on the run from a gang of FBI agents and a, 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 an amalgamated force of federal marshals, that the first thing you want to do is you want to get on Twitter and get <laughs> status report. Naturally. You know, right? That's what I would do. Totally. But, you know, it keeps everybody in this but hysteria they, and social media is now just like this crazy part of it. You know? See, this is, a, this is where we go into cognitive dissonance heavily. It's like we've suspended b belief long enough to get these suppositional scenarios that they set up for us, which has been the hallmark. And I've been studying this stuff for a long time. I go back to JFK assassination, which I studied when I was a kid and realized then they ask us to make a lot of assumptions that once you went beyond the obvious point, didn't hold water anymore at a time when people were not awoken enough to do citizen journalism this way. And when, what you said earlier about news, this is why I have become cynical enough to say that these are staged events, just looking at them, because I've analyzed dozens of them. And for as long as I've been on air, I've done this. I've done research into these events. And quite honestly, after Sandy Hook, I said, I'm not doing this anymore because it's sucking me dry. And it's like, once you cry wolf, why should I believe any of the other ones? You exactly. know, like, yeah, I don't have yeah. time to look into every single shooting because they happen yeah. daily now. And so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not one of these people who says people die or they didn't die. I don't know. But yeah. once you have one that I'm like, Sandy Hook, hmm, I'm pretty sure that nobody died yeah. there unless there was somebody who talked. Right. That's, exa that's my thought. Supposed to. Yep. Maybe that's when the real deaths happen. I don't really know, but um, you know. But the, uh, when you were talking about JFK, that's that's one of the areas that's that I've looked into lower. a lot. That's actually the nexus of where I think this all started. Yeah, and I did a lot of research on that from the esoteric perspective, and there's just so much insane stuff built into that that it's it's almost like. I, I have no idea what that event was. I have no clue whatsoever. It's like so weird. And there's, there's so many Kabbalistic elements to it that, uh, that, that was really what got me started in all this. Actually. I, um, the, the first, what, what I like to do, or I, I, when I kind of was like, I, I was introduced to the idea that nine 11 was a ritual event. There's a, there's a cool video out there called, uh, Oh, it's, uh, do you believe in magic? And it's, uh, some British guy doing this multi-part series on all these elements of 9-11 um, as a ritual. And I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. And so then I started like looking at, uh, going on Google and looking at like layouts of different places. And it's very interesting. I realized that Daly Plaza 
is laid out like the Kabbalah tree of life. And it has all of these directions and allusions to it built in that reflect the Masonic temple. So to give a quick example, in Masonry, you have the, the two pillars that are for, you know, the profane, the, the good and evil, everything's black and white, you know, like the checkered board. But then the middle pillar is like the hidden one. That's the equilibrium of the two. And so Daily Plaza, it's very interesting. You have the, you know, the north and south pillars. Uh, Main Street is the equilibrium pillar. And then Elm Street is the North Pillar, the pillar of severity. You know, probably why Elm is so, you know, a nightmare in Elm Street, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Commerce is the pillar of mercy. Um, so the interesting thing is Main Street divides the North and South line because you have North and South Houston, North and South Lamar, there's some other streets. But that Main Street divides where the North and South goes and that is the directions of the masonic temple so it's all laid out according to the tree of life and a masonic temple and it's very interesting where and on the 33rd parallel yeah yeah and um albert pike was talking about oh there's all these interesting allusions to babylon where there's a river um the euphrates and it's albert pike right, right writes that it's on the roughly between the 32nd 33rd parallel right. That's right where Dallas is, um, and that there is a Trinity River, and it flows in the same direction as the Euphrates River. So I have all of this like kind of laid out. There's so many correlations to esoteric Freemasonry that are built into Daily Plaza, and um, it's it's pretty wild. <laughs> the whole state of Texas is extremely uh, occultic, or or. Um, uh, Masonic or, you know, what, with all of those kinds of things. Cause I lived in Austin for a number of years and all of those, there's all of that there as well. There's uh, Trinity, right? There's Trinity, which is right along, right, right down near the river in Austin. There's Lamar street, whatever Lamar in Austin probably runs. Like, I wonder if we, we probably could draw a line. It probably is. If you, if it didn't have the space of all the land between it would be connected. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. there, you know, Austin is extremely, um, you know, full is totally full of all sorts of weird symbolic and, um, you know, mystical kind of stuff that people there don't really understand. Um, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, um, to, to talk about some of the ritual stuff, um, you know, like JFK, uh, there's a lot of parallels to some like Crowley type magic and Thelema and golden Dawn stuff. And so, uh, th there's this thing in the, you know, the esoteric religion, uh, the, this mystery name called Io. I think that's, it's just I A O and it's for Isis Apophis, which is just set and Osiris. And Crowley says that that is the name that contains the secret of all in nature. And he says in ritual magic, the, there's like three main methods. And the third one is the dramatic. And so if you reenact a myth of gods or goddesses, that's like, he says, basically, you could start a religion with that type of magic. That's how potent mm. it is. And so with that being uh, Osiris and Isis and the Destroyer, you have John F. Kennedy as Osiris, Jackie Kennedy as Isis, and Lee Harvey Oswald as Set or the Destroyer. And so there's all these interesting allusions to that. I mean, Osiris is the king, and Kennedy is the only president, aside from some Obama illusions that's portrayed as a king, right? The king of oh, Camelot. Camelot. Camelot, yeah. And, Camelot, and yeah. Camelot has a lot of Kabbalistic things driving back to the Rosicrucians and Knights mm -hmm. Templar and um, Knights of Malta. And what's very interesting is uh, in some of the research I went through, you know, like there's that news story. I don't know how true it is, but it's out there to the masses. It's a mainstream news article, so people will believe it. Uh, you know, that all the presidents stem back to the Plantagenet line of uh, King John of England. Right. Um, and what's very interesting is that the round table stems back to Henry VIII. There's a, there's a round table depiction at Winchester Castle, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's supposed to be King Henry VIII in King Arthur's place. So it's Camelot and the round table. And King Henry VIII was the union of the bloodlines of the Plantagenet lines merging into one. That's what the Tudor rose is. There's a white rose and a red rose and they're merging. So, there's a Plantagenet connection to Camelot and, and the round table and, um, you know, esoteric mythology. And if you add it in that JFK is of the Plantagenet line, whether you believe it to be true or not, they certainly put it out in mainstream uh, news. Like 
it's it's very strange how deeply esoteric these threads run and so there's this sort of like death and resurrection that goes into alchemy and if you read carl jung's writings there's a book he has a collective volume there the red yeah. book yeah he's got so much yeah. stuff um yeah that's this, that's a book you sit down and you go through over a year to even absorb some of it yeah that one uh i think he might have gone a little mad in that one because that's like i think one of his like later ones and yes but um there's there's one called the mysterium conjunctionis mm -hmm. it's the latin words of the you know mysterious union and it's volume 14 and it's really interesting once i started reading that there's this thing in uh occult alchemy called the transmutation of the king and the king goes through this death and resurrection and if you start reading it you'll realize all of these elements are there in the jfk presidency up until the assassination and then it up through the moon landing to me the whole moon landing was the resurrection of osiris in the divine osiris body where jfk is like the lower one and then even in this alchemy it says that there's there's something about returning the king back to his primal animal nature. Um, and you do this through uh, the seduction or trap set by a beautiful woman. And so you have Marilyn Monroe in that. Yes. Um, and then there's all of these ritual elements that are combined in the JFK assassin assassination. There's all these strange allusions to, I'll just go through them real quick. I don't need to get them into all, but there's the death of the resurrection of Hiram Abiff and Osiris. Uh, Azazel scapegoat ritual, which is a uh, Leviticus ritual for uh, sexual atonement. And there's a lot of weird stuff going on there in relationship to Marilyn Monroe and the two women before he gets shot, Mary Mormon and Norma Jean Hill. I'll get into that in a second. But And then there's a Golden Dawn ritual called the, the Final Judgment, the Last Judgment, that's basically has direct correspondences to it. And um, there's a couple of the minor things, but the Hiram Abiff thing, if you think about it, Hiram Abiff is struck in the, the neck, chest, and head. And so where were Kennedy's wounds? You know, he, he had injuries to his chest cavity. He got hit in the neck and then hit in the head, or at least we saw that in the Zapruder film. And so he was killed, like Hiram Abiff was killed, three blows, three bullets, granted one was supposed to have missed. But either way, it's the same thing. And then he has this resurrection at his funeral where the eternal flame is lit by Jackie Kennedy and she's like this Isis figure. And if you look into mythology, there's something called the Vestal Virgins and they tend to this sacred flame. So they dress her up in her Isis morning attire and she's got her two kids, like the Gemini twins dressed on each side of her in the same exact outfits. And then she's lighting the, the eternal flame like the Vestal Virgins do. So it's so much weird Kabbalistic stuff to build into it. And it begs you to question like, how much of it was real and was this a Pruder film like, was that just like a complete Kabbalistic production that was based on an event? Because people have questioned a lot of its authenticity and not to mention the fact it came from a 33rd degree Freemason, Edward uh, Abraham Zapruder. And that's not like speculation. That's like out in the mainstream that he was a Mason. So it's not like a conspiracy site that claims everybody's a Mason, you know? Yeah, so Jay Widener has actually analyzed that film and said that he's found as aspects of uh, certain theatrical craft within the Zapruder film itself. Mm -hmm. and the, you know, that was one of his, unfortunately, Jay's gone off the deep end too, but... Um, Everybody does at some point, you know? <laughs> well, it's a crazy world. Can you come back? That's Have you question. read, um, by any chance, um, James Shelby Downer, King Kill 33? Uh, I've heard that. That's a Marilyn Manson song. <laughs> King yeah, Kill well, it came from Downer. And Downer's <laughs> yeah. an interesting guy. If you ever get a chance, I think you'll find some affirming, interesting things in it. It's kind of a dark cult work. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of what I started off doing. There's so much stuff with the JFK. And if, you know, people want to elaborate that, I did a talk on Higher Side Chats with Greg Carlwood. It's the last one I did. And I go into a lot of stuff with that. And so... Yeah, and the other thing is, just to one last connection, the, um, t speaking of rituals, to me, the Apollo 11 event was this giant ritual. And we, we, so we're, we're going to talk about like hoax events as rituals. Um, so there's this idea of taking the lower Osiris, which is flawed. And so to me, that's like this idea of JFK and this extramarital affair. And in alchemy, you purify it through a baptism by 
fire and fire. water. And so there's the baptism by fire in Daly Plaza, and then there's the baptism by water at his funeral. We got the Catholic priest, and he's got the little Dagon hat sprinkling the water on the coffin of Osiris. And, um, and the other thing that's pretty interesting is there's a giant obelisk with 14 segments in Daly Plaza with the eternal flame on top of it. Um, so 14 pieces of Osiris, uh, you know, cut into pieces. And so, and it's very interesting that the resurrection, it's sort of like everything, like the hard thing that some to, to get across is that so much of this esoteric stuff is psychological. It's a transmutation of mindsets, yep. the transmutation of consciousness. People, all of these occultists think in the quote unquote spiritual terms, the, 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 the material aspect of it is actually secondary and sometimes doesn't even matter. So this is what I wonder with a lot of these events, yep. if these occultists think like, oh, moon landing, that doesn't have to be real. The material world is an illusion. We're just yeah. going to teach our mystery religion through it. And that's the spiritual truth, according to them. So it doesn't matter if it's real or not. That, and yeah, yeah. And it, it, for the profane, they're the ones that see the the um, the dead letter meaning of things. They're the ones that see like the outer meaning. But you're still, if you're going to initiate the masses through these levels, this, this is what I think is happening to us. As, as strange as it sounds, I think that they're initiating us into their religion through very slow increments, and part of the alchemical process as expressed by Baphomet is taking the horror of the sinner, which is the goat's head, which is representative of everything profane. So it's atheism in a materialistic sense. It's all exoteric religion. Um, you know, anything that falls under those mindsets or consciousness that's profane. And so the goal of the adepts is to transmute that into Godhead. But of course it's their version of Godhead, how they interpret it. So, they do this through the process, it's called in the grado or the blackness. So you take whatever you're gonna transmute and then you push it into darkness. And there's a lot of weird viewpoints on how this works where it's like having that horror or that terror releases some, that whatever the active force is inside you in its pure form. And then you purge that lead and then you coagulate that pure spirit into like a different form of consciousness and you keep repeating that and that's what the caduceus is you separate synthesize separate so you see the the serpents going it's essentially out. no different yeah. than, it's essentially no different than traumatic programming in an mk ultra program exactly it basically it's induced trauma yeah. to produce the alchemical within the body itself yeah so even very similar to how you would split the mind a mind control subject in a, in a program, this is being done on a mass level, which goes back to what Emily and I talk about in terms of the projects themselves being experiments that are then scaled onto a societal level over decades. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so that's what the knowledge of good and evil is it, in, in their yeah. terms. It's yeah. uh, you create a bad guy, you create a good guy. So Lee Harvey Oswald, JFK. Yeah. And then you synthesize them in an event and you do some alchemical transmutation, you purge this or that, and then you rebirth it into a new form. And so that new form, think about it, JFK was the one who initiated us into the idea of going to the moon, right? Right. He was the moon president. And there's all this stuff like, I won't get into it now because like astrology is a whole other thing, but there's so much astrological correspondence to these things. Yep. Where um, JFK his midheaven is in cancer, the moon sign. So the midheaven is where you strive for your greatest. It's like your great work potential. So according to his chart, his great work would be through right. the moon. Yeah. And so, um, and then his moon is in Virgo. So it's like the virgin moon, right? The Virgo. And so that's the whole idea of Osiris impregnating the virgin, right? Like the, the virgin birth uh, through the moon, which no man has touched. Right. So you can see how they play off of these archetypes. Yeah. And, um, so what, what did they do at the moon landings or alleged moon landing? They birthed this unity consciousness. And even like, if you listen to Carl Sagan's gift of Apollo, mm -hmm. um, he talks about what was the gift of Apollo. It was seeing the world without borders and its oneness and its splendor. And these, all these terms, if you just read through the mystery religion doctrine, like that's exactly what their conception of deity is. And um, 
not not to I, I don't I don't take any positions on the whole flat Earth globe Earth thing, but I think this is very interesting. Um, it's something that I came across in the alchemical writings. The compass and the square represent a spherical Earth and a flat Earth. The square is a plane geometry. Even Albert Pike talks about this, and he says that this to the ancients was a flat plane. So that's what's profane, right? And the compass is about spheres and spherical trigonometry, and that's the divine nature. And so you're trying to unify them, and that's what the G is at the middle. Uh, you know, it's uh, if you use a number association, it's the letter. It's a number three in Hebrew for the Hebrew letter Gimel, or it's a number seven for the seventh letter of the alphabet. Those are pretty divine numbers, right? And so. Um, and the square is four and the compass is three. So combine them, the number seven, right? And so what's interesting is, and Carl Jung's writing is on alchemy. He talks about how the alchemists use this concept of taking the, the, the mother's bed, which mother meaning earth, this is like typical, the moon or the earth are, are, you know, the feminine aspects of what these things represent. And so, um, the, the square of a mother's bed is to be transmuted into a globe by the alchemists. This is like directly verbatim from their yeah. doctrines. And it's like, wow, that's really interesting. So the alchemists like transmuting flat things into globes. What the well, hell? I, I, <laughs> you know, it's very yeah. strange. Well, I've opined a, every, a lot of things you're saying right now are sort of complimenting or confirming a lot of things that we've talked about and that Randy and I, you know, sort of have our sort of view of things set around. And one of those things for me is why does the earth have to be flat or round? Couldn't it be both, right? Like if this has to do with things being as they are dependent on where you are with your consciousness, why is this an either or discussion instead of a both and? Like my view of how whatever this reality is, is that there is sort of a flat plane with sort of a circular energetic around it, right? Like, you know what I mean? And, you know, or also the idea that if we're in a simulation, why would it have to be the same all the time, right? So. Um, you know, so that, but my question before that to you was going to be that, you know, it sounds like when we, when people get into these arguments about these events and about the shape of the earth and whatever, it's, it's always either, or there's the people who think these things are definitely real. There's these people who think that these things are definitely fake. And my question, you know, sort of partly was that, you know, would they, would the people doing this see it more powerful to do something that was actually real or for them would there is there actually even more power in sort of creating something but what i'm kind of sort of getting here is that this sort of fusion of things where there are elements of reality and elements of complete you know sort of something being totally made up or or psychological in nature and you know that sort of fusion of things makes for the most powerful event and also if for the way it's initiating people the people who are sort of I think becoming most advanced in their consciousness while all these things happen can see the nuances and how these things are put together and don't think it's an either or thing. They see sort of this union, what you're talking about, of reality and non-reality sort of, you know, weaving in and out just like the, the snake on the, um, the staff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, Is that uh, the right idea here? It, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting how, like just from an allegorical standpoint, like, the flat earth represents so many things in occultism that are profane. And it's pretty interesting how we were programmed to think that that's the dumbest thing ever. Like that's like the all encompassing, like, Oh, can you believe this or that? And again, I'm not somebody who gives an opinion. I don't know what it is. Actually, I go for the, I go for the turtle model. That's, that's what I say. It just looks cool. That's my only question. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. <laughs> but, um, but the point is, it's pretty interesting when you read through these doctrines and see another uh, point to be made is like who they think are the bad guys or who they think is profane, especially figures throughout history. And then who they think is enlightened. And what I find is when I started looking into some more university level research with what I could, it's really expensive to buy a lot of those books. And so I had to bite the bullet with some things or just try to get snippets off Google books. But uh, so much of like the university history like quote unquote debunks a lot of the history that we are accustomed to knowing, but it's usually through media. And so a lot of the stuff that has to do with like the library of Alexandria and Hypatia and stuff like that, those actually seem more like mythologies to me now um, because the mystery religion relies so heavy on those. And it's very interesting. Their views on history align perfectly with what we get in like the history channel and those kind of specials on mm -hmm. TV. 
But when you read these university books where they have primary sources, they basically say like, there's so much stuff that's just been turned into something that it's not based on the text. And so I wonder how much of our history they create these mythologies to mm -hmm. teach their religion through it. And so to get back to what you were saying, I, I think that they're trying to mold the world in their own image and their own doctrine. Now, however much of that matches physical reality, I don't know. I'm not somebody who can look at the sun and calculate the angle of rays and tell you yeah. what shape we're <laughs> on. But there is absolutely a motivation for them faking it. Uh, yeah. So that's like, you know, good news for the flat earthers. But so when people say, what's the motivation? Well, I have this other series called the Occult Science Series, and it basically goes into how so much of our modern science is purely based on like Kabbalah, the Big Bang, mm -hmm. evolution, all of these things. These are all doctrines that are in theosophy and whatever. And another point I wanted to make, I wanted to make it earlier. The reason I choose certain books to kind of put more emphasis on, I, I, I go a lot into morals and dogma. I go a lot into Madame Blavatsky and Isis Unveiled and Secret Doctrine. And the reasoning for it is one, there's a statue of Albert Pike in Washington, D.C. Exactly. And everybody hates Confederate things. And he was right. part of the Confederacy. But nobody, okay with nobody wants to take that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And not to mention all the Freemasons, like, you know, in to building. Everybody knows there's a Masonic influence in government. Whether you're conspiratorial about it or not, I mean, they yeah. make specials about it on the History Channel now. Secrets of the Freemasons, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, just in movies like National Treasure, Da Vinci Code, all that stuff. So, yeah. and, and then the United Nations is following Madame Blavatsky's teachings. It's kind of hidden. It's through their spiritual foundation called Lucius Trust. And it's based on the esoteric understanding of Lucifer. Yeah. And you yeah. can go, this is all, you can go right to the website. You can read, yeah. they're trying to bring in the age of Aquarius. This is all like mainstream stuff. But Lucius Trust is more under the radar than the, what people see on the face of the UN, right? And so Madame Blavatsky's teachings become very important because they specifically say that they're following them and the United Nations pretty much has their hands in everything. And you can just start to see the web that they've woven is based so much on this doctrine. And so that's kind of a, a point that I wanted to, to bring up that that's the reasoning why I put so much emphasis on those particular books. And it's amazing when you start looking at all these things with cosmology, um, how much they align. And one of the examples when you're talking about what we were talking about before the shape of the sphere to them reflects deity again the compass and the reason for it is their idea the idea of deity is this this infinite like one point of like nothingness it's kind of abstract but the point is at the center of the sphere that's the, the that's the the middle point and then uh, Johannes Kepler talks about how the reason it reflects deity is that you can make infinite points on the surface of the sphere from the center so it's, I don't like know zero, it's like the zero point. Yeah. And so, yeah. and that's why you see like the, the sun glyph in astrology is the point with the circle around it. And you can see that kind of stuff all over the place in logos. Well, it's an infinite array. Yeah. Whereas you have a fixed plane and the fixed plane is, is platonic solid as opposed to a sphere, which generates infinite arrays coming off of each, which again goes into the sun and the son of God, the S-U-N of God, which is literally in the Bible, when the sun rises, you know, there's all that. Yeah, like the 12 apostles, 12 zodiacs. Exactly, like but that. they're actually 13. You know, <laughs> they, they always hide the 13th. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's more of a astrology misnomer where the mm -hmm. Western, Western astrology is based on the seasons and geometry. And so right. the actual constellations are like... It's kind of complex. You'd, you'd have to go deeper in astrology. But when people bring up that 13th side sign argument, that's kind of like they have a misconception of how Western astrology works. And I, I won't really get into that. Um, I'm, I'm I wasn't sure. looking at it from the astrological. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. But like, I was it, looking at it from a more, I'll say, the esoteric aspect of the 12 and the 13 and how that interacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And, um, but good point. It is interesting too that Ophiuchus, that so-called thirteenth sign, it, it's has this like serpent aspect to it, and yeah, in in occultism, Christ and Lucifer are kind of like the same of the same essence, the same an, an initiatory mindset, and there's like this 
idea of the serpent force and what that really is. And this gets into a lot of like exoteric outer meaning and esoteric inner meaning stuff. But um, yeah, that, that, that idea of the sphere being divine, like, oh, Johannes Kepler also talked about how curved lines are of God or deity and, and straight lines are of man or the profane, yeah. the, the animal nature. So it's pretty interesting. Like all these Freemasonic concepts were built into all these guys who gave us the heliocentric model. And the, the one thing I can say is, I, I kind of had this inkling that things are geocentric mm-hmm. um, based on what I read in all these doctrines. Everything is built on heliocentrism. They're their foundation of everything. So whatever the shape of the earth, I don't really care. I just think that the geocentric is what they view as profane. And I think that that's one of the secrets that, mm-hmm. um, you I know, that, that's why I'm proud to be profane. The square is of the earth. So yeah. I, I think that I, I let, that's what I like to reverse on. That's just my opinion. But so there's so many weird allusions to this and um when we get into the uh androgyny stuff i can get into the root race cycle and how that relates to darwinian evolution the big bang and a lot of that cosmology because that cycle is kind of built in to what these quote-unquote adepts think is the path of humanity and they think that they're the ones that are guiding it whether whether you they're just, the re- uh, you know. <laughs> well you just stressed the stage for the second part of this we're coming up on on the hour mark so mm-hmm. um is there anything else we want to cover in this segment uh, if you guys have any things you wanted me to mention Someone? before we move on go for so, it yeah no i think we did a good job sort of ripping through some of that stuff and um before in the second hour guys we're going to talk about um uh transgenderism and androgyny from an occult perspective and we're going to dig deep into that and see uh see where we go but before we move over into the patrons our michael can you please tell everybody um, both where they can find your work and also i michael's available for astrology sessions as well so you want to tell people, <laughs> don't want to tell people about that yeah uh the astrology pursuit is something that uh, since i looked into so much of the astrology stuff studying this it kind of was a, a byproduct of that. And I figured I'd, I'd give it a little go and see what happens with it. I kind of view astrology very different than a lot of people. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, I'm more into like the natal chart stuff and it's more psychological mm-hmm. and uh, analyzing aspects of your, your, your life through that lens. Um, and then you can, it's funny cause I'm in a transition period. I'm trying to kind of get off YouTube eventually because of all the censorship, but uh us too. For, for right now, um, I have all my stuff on YouTube. I have a Vimeo channel, which I'll be trying to do more with. And so I guess I can give you guys links for that. You can put it in the description, but it's Schism 206. Schism like the Tool song, yeah. number 206. And you can find that on Vimeo, on YouTube. Um, I have my podcast, which is just something I do for fun. It's nothing too serious. And um yeah, I have a I have a, a blog home site that has links for everything. So I'll give you guys that. People can just go yeah, to that. That's great. First. That's perfect. We'll just put that up with all. And what what is it? Can you just say it now so people can can hear it as well? The name of your blog. Uh, it, if you go to, uh, it's, it's a pistachio blog. Oh, okay. <laughs> pistache, like you spell the, the the you know the pistachio nut, like uh, yeah. pistache dot io, and it's schism two oh six. Um, okay. And and I have. And I've had an astrology reading from Michael and I very much enjoyed it. So um, people can contact you for those as well. Yes. Yeah. And uh, right now it's, it's a pretty discounted rate because I'm, you know, I'm just kind of testing it out. It's 30 bucks per hour on Skype. It's recorded and I don't have a lot of time, but people are, feel free to email me. And if I can fit it in, we can do it. Or if people are kind of like, uh, you know, don't, don't need it right away. You know, like, you're just like, Oh, you know, maybe a few months or something like that. I, I kind of, you know, fill in the gaps with it here and there for now, but I would like to do a little bit more with it seriously in the next couple of years or something like that. All right. Really cool. All right. Those links will be up and your main link will be underneath the little title bar of this video. And right. we're going to back it out of here for now, folks. Don't forget the website is offplanetradio.com and you can go over there to find the public side of what we do. If you want more, you can go to uh, patreon.com forward slash off planet media become a patron and get the inside skinny we'll be back on the other side